Let's turn to Numbers chapter 20. I want to teach you this morning on a very important subject. One little act, one little thing took Moses right out of the picture. Kind of very interesting. Uh, sometimes we don't understand why. And this is one of those moments I've honestly have questioned, God, why would you do this? I mean, really. I mean, Moses was so faithful in all that he did. And kind of to paint a little bit of the background, Moses, you remember, was uh, taken out of the river, taken into Egypt. He was raised in Egypt for 40 years. Towards the very end of those 40 years, he began to question who he was and what he was. Finally, he came to realize that there was a calling of God upon his life, and he had to make a decision. And he made that decision, according to Hebrews, that we see that he refused to be part of what God was doing there in uh, Egypt. He wanted to suffer the reproach rather than enjoy the pleasure of sin. He was willing to leave everything in the materialistic world that he knew and begin to go with the things of Christ. And so one day he went out, he uh, saw this Egyptian who had been beating up this Israelite. He stepped in and he killed this Egyptian. He looked this way, he looked that way, then he killed the Egyptian and he buried him thinking no one saw him. Kind of interesting, he had a problem because he looked this way and this way, but he never looked up. He did that very same thing at the Red Sea. You remember, he looked at the Red Sea, and then he turned around and saw the Egyptians, and he said, woe is me. He fell down and began to pray, but he didn't look up. So one of the things that he should have done, number one, is not to kill the Egyptian, but number two, he should have looked up. And so we find him, because of that, the next day he went out, two Israels were fighting. He stopped that, and they said, are you going to kill us too? Well, Moses knew that he had been caught. So he takes off to the wilderness for 40 years. And for the next 40 years, we find God working in his life, stripping him, taking him down to the very nitty-gritty. And it was God doing a work in his heart because God had to have a man who could hear his voice, and God had to have a man who would be able to handle three million people complaining every single day. So every day, the Bible said the children of Israel murmured in their tent. But he was able to keep his eyes on God, had a great relationship with God, able to give us the law and work with the people of God. In fact, he even said, God, if you don't forgive them, then take my name out of the book of life. He becomes a great example of Christ. Then we find him saying to the 12 spies, go into the land so he sent them. Ten came back with an evil report. Two came back with a good report. Because of that evil report, he now understood that God was going to punish the children of Israel. They were going to have to stay in the wilderness for another 40 years. So check it out. 40 years in Egypt, learning everything. 40 years himself in the desert, unlearning everything. Now another 40 years because of somebody making a wrong decision. So this is at the end of his life. 120 years, everything's gone great, couldn't be better. God has used him. Miriam was his sister. Aaron was his brother. Aaron is going to die in this chapter. Miriam is going to die in this chapter. She was smitten with leprosy, but again Moses came and prayed for her. Aaron was one of those guys that lied Moses said, what happened? He said, I just threw the gold in and out came a calf. <laughs> you know, yeah, right, okay. And so here is Moses. But in this chapter, something tragic happens. Moses now is dealing with a brand new generation. The old has perished, the brand new has come. And he's expecting this great generation, these young kids, to do something great. But what happens is they break his heart. Not only are they... Like their parents, they're worse than their parents, and he loses it. Moses comes undone. He goes in, he beats the rock, and God says, come here. And Moses says, what can I do for you, God? And God said, did I tell you to beat the rock? No. Did I tell you to do anything of that matter? No. Did I tell you to accuse the people or call them names? No. Why did you do it? He said, they've made me mad. And God says, because of this, you cannot go in to the promised land. 
120 years of faithfulness. And God says, this one act, you cannot go in. For some of us, we're going to have a hard time with that. For those of us that understand, I think it's a great warning that be careful because when God blesses, it does not mean He's not going to hold you responsible. With great responsibility comes incredible accountability. And when you believe that you are now in charge, you are no longer a value to God. Moses takes things into his own hands, and because of that, he brought fear into the people of God. He now abuses the people of God. We pick up the story here in chapter 20. As I mentioned, Miriam had been a hindrance because of leprosy. She dies in this chapter. Aaron, his lack of leadership, he's going to die in this chapter. And so it says in chapter 20, verse 12, verse 1, I should say, Then came the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, unto the desert of Sin. And the first month, the people abode in Kadesh. Now, this is the second time they've been at Kadesh. They came one other time, 40 years earlier. They sent the spies out. They came back with the evil report. Now, this is 100. And, their time would be 80 years difference, or Moses, 120 years of sin. And Miriam died there and was buried there. Verse 2, there was no water for the congregation, and they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. Didn't take them very long to come after Moses and Aaron. The people became angry with Moses and spoke, saying, Would God that we had died with our brother and died before the Lord? Now, that would be uh, when Korah sinned against God, God opened the earth, and once again the people fell in. They're saying, Would to God we would have went down in the pit rather than die of starvation and no water. The people chided with him. Verse 4, Why have ye brought us the congregation of the Lord into the wilderness, that we and our cattle should die there. So now they're accusing Moses. So this begins to turn against Moses. Wherefore have ye made us to come up out of Egypt, to bring us up into a land of an evil place? Now they're saying that Canaan is going to be an evil place, where there is no seed or figs or vines or pomegranates. You remember he said you're going to be taken to a place Houses you have not built, vineyards you have not planted, God is going to bless you. So the young kids are saying, we don't see the fruit of all the blessing. Where are they, Moses? And verse 6, Moses and Aaron went up from the presence of the assembly unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and they fell upon their face, and the glory of the Lord appeared unto them, which they did oftentimes. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take the rod, and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and seek ye into, and, and speak unto the rock before their eyes. It shall bring forth water. And thou shalt bring forth the water out of the rock, so thou shalt give the congregation and their beast drink. And everything's perfect. I mean, it couldn't be any better. The people are weird. Moses is kind of upset. God is calming everybody down. I'm not upset. They need water. I understand that, Moses, you're a little bit tense. They need to drink. Their animals need to drink. It's fair. I understand that. But something happened right here that absolutely takes this story to a whole other degree. And verse 9, Moses took the rod from before the Lord. That would be Aaron's rod that budded as he was commanded. But in verse 10, 11, and 12, everything falls apart. He says in verse 10, Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together, the rock, and said unto them, Hear now, ye rebels, must we fetch water out of this rock? Two things. Number one, did God say that they were rebels? No. Did God tell them they were rebellious? No. What is Moses doing? Number two, I thought it was the Holy Spirit bringing the water. I thought all these miracles were done by God. Why is now Moses taking credit? Why is he now exalting himself? Do we have to bring water out of these rocks? Do I have to take care of everything you do? So you see his attitude beginning to build. And verse 11, And Moses lifted up his hand with, notice, his rod. He got rid of the one rod, went back to his rod, and smote the rock twice. The water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and the beast also. So the people didn't see anything, but 
God saw it, Moses saw it, and the people sensed it. They sensed Moses was irate. The way he hit the rock. The way that he begins to call them rebellious. And then in verse 12, the Lord spake to Moses, come here, Moses and Aaron, because ye believed me not, you did not sanctify me, you did not glorify me, you did not honor me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring the congregation into the land that I gave. Unbelievable. And so you sit here and you think, now wait a second. You mean if someone is faithful to God for 120 years and they make one big mistake, that's all it takes. Yeah, one mistake. If I was on the corner kissing some gal, that's all it takes. I wouldn't even have to be in adultery. Just a kiss would take me out of ministry and ruin my marriage. In other words, what happened? What took him down that road? That's what I want to know. And I would suggest he lost the fear of God. And secondly, very important, he took his eyes off of God. His life had been trained to deal with issues. And for the first time, I think, in my life, I kind of realized that why 40 years in the wilderness? Because God had to prepare him to be able to deal with some of the most incredible people he would ever deal with in his life. He did great. For 40 years, he was able to deal with these people. But this new generation, he had great hope. And by taking his eyes off of God and putting his eyes on this new hope, and that's what we can do now. We can take our eyes off of people, and we can put our eyes on our kids, and we're going to be disappointed. We can put our eyes on, you know, a church or government, we will get disappointed. Whenever you take your eyes off of God, you're going to have a tough time. And what's going to happen is you're going to start making mistakes, and you're going to get angry. And if I'm not understanding what God is teaching, where I can step back and say, God, I need to put my eyes back on you really quick, then I'm going to make a horrible mistake in my life. And that's what we do. We get angry with our wife, and sometimes we even become verbal, and sometimes we even become abusive physically. Sometimes we become absolutely out of control with our kids. We say things we would never say to anybody else, but we say it to them. Because they've embarrassed us. Because they don't listen. And so that gives us the right to tell them how we think or how we feel. And those kids will never forget what you said. And sometimes we get so offended with people in the church, we just cop an attitude. Or sometimes we go to work and we feel like, I own this place. I can do what I want. Well, God owns you. You better be careful. So once again, Moses violated everything that he understood. And he took his eyes, and this is the mistake he made. So number one, what did Moses do? I want to know. There's a few things that stand out to me. Number one, he lost control in verse 10. Number one, he lost control. Is that you? Are you going down the 110 freeway and has someone cut you off? What do you do? <laughs> well, all of a sudden, you begin to speed up. What are you doing? Well, I want to catch up. Your wife is saying, don't. You're saying, I'm going to. The kids are beginning to scream. You got the kids screaming, the wife screaming, and you want to catch up. What are you going to do? Look at the guy and say, Jesus loves you? I don't think so. And what happens if you catch up with the guy and he cops an attitude and pulls behind you and begins to follow you home? Now you're in trouble. You wish you would have never done that. But what pushed your buttons? What made you do that? You wouldn't listen to your wife. You wouldn't listen to the kids screaming. But something drove you to the point you went crazy. Well, I believe, again, you lost the fear of God. You took things into your own hands, and that's what he says here. He's out of control. And notice verse 10. Moses and Aaron and the congregation together came before the rock. He did this before the rock. So sometimes I lose heart even before the rock of Jesus Christ. And he judges the people in verse 10. Notice, ye are rebellious. He's never done that before. When God spoke to him, he said, you're stiff-necked. But now he's accusing them. He's, making, he's angry at them. And how many things have we said to our pastor or to our wives or to our bosses we wish we would have never done? We get angry with people, and so we begin to do that. And God says, don't do that. Those are my people. I died. I bled for them. And though you might not like them, I died for them. They belong to me. So you better take care of these who you don't like because I'm the one who is going to take care of them. And then we see also in verse 10, he began to... He changes God's Word. 
He says here, Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock and said to them, hear now, uh uh-oh, ye are rebellious. Hear now, listen to me, not listen to the word of God. Before, it was word for word God's word. Now, let me suggest that when I begin to speak for myself, when I begin to lie, when I begin to exaggerate, I am now out of control. So some people say, well, I don't think I'm out of control. Are you lying? Are you exaggerating? Are you making excuses? Are you not being honest? You're going to sit there and tell me there's no problem in your marriage and she hasn't been with you for a year? (laughs) You're going to tell me your kids love you when they are frightened when you lift up your hand? No, you can't do that. But when you lose the fear of God, you can do anything. In other words, there's nothing going to stop you. The reason why I would not kiss that girl on the corner is not because of you, but because I fear God and because I love my wife. That's how it should be and because I also don't want to hurt you. But when that fear is gone and I'm mad at my wife, anything is possible. So I need to really understand what happened because God prepared him, and that's what you have to understand. God gave him the shoulders for this responsibility. God gave him the heart for this ministry. God gave you the heart for what you do. And it can be big, and it can be huge, but you can blame it on the pressure. No, it's not the pressure. It's the moment you gave in. It's the moment you didn't turn to God. That's what you have to understand. But not only did he lose heart and lose control, secondly, this is so important, he exalted himself. He has never done this before. In verse 10, notice the very last sentence must we fetch the water out of this rock do we have to do everything for you is that Moses Moses was a servant Moses was always trying to help people Moses was the guy that said take my name out of the book of life Moses was the one that said God if you don't forgive them then I don't want to serve you no more Moses was always standing up for the people of God now Moses is beginning to go crazy What is wrong with you, young generation? Do I have to carry the water to you? Now, God never did that. So two things happened in the people's lives. Number one, they knew that God was mad at them. And secondly, they knew they were rebellious and God was going to punish them. How did they know that? Through Moses. That's why God disqualified Moses. You see, when I am no longer a witness for God, when I no longer am able to live Christianity or to be able to help people, I'm done. And sometimes we don't see that. He was able to exalt himself. And thirdly, he destroyed himself. I want to say that one more time. He destroyed himself. Israel did not destroy himself. We would say, oh, Israel did it, or my marriage did it, or all these kids did it, or these dogs did it. No, you did it. In other words, here in verse 11, Moses lifted up his hand. He was angry. And his rod, so he exchanged the rod. And I just thought today, I wonder if he got rid of Aaron's rod, took his rod, because he knew he was going to beat the rock. But you're going to look at me and say, now why did he get in trouble beating the rock? You remember what Jesus said? He will die once and once only. In Exodus chapter 12, God told him to beat the rock. That was a symbol of Jesus Christ. Christ had to be crucified. But he is to die once and once only. When Moses hit the rock the second time, it means that once again, he was punishing and beating Jesus Christ. That will never happen again. He broke the type. The second time here is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Moses completely destroyed the type. In other words, what God is saying is, Moses, you destroyed the type. I I told you, just speak to it. All you have to do is talk. And you're beating Jesus Christ over again. And why? Because he lost the fear. Why? Because he's angry. Why? Because the people got under his skin. Kind of like Mordecai and Haman. Every day, Mordecai got underneath of Haman's skin. And it made him do things he didn't want to do. And sometimes that happens in our life. And so in verse 11, he lifted up his hands. And then notice verse 12. The Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, Because ye believe me not. And here is the killer to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel. Because you beat me and because you beat the people, you're done. And we think, well, now wait, is that fair? Well, 
if you are beating your wife and your children, is it right that you come down and have a church? No. If you're not going to be faithful with the sheep God gave you, then how are you going to be faithful with more sheep? You can't. And yet, it happens all the time. If I'm not going to yield my life to God, what in the world's wrong with me? And so here is a guy who for 120 years is my hero. But in a moment of weakness, God nails him. And for years I thought, God, now can we just talk about this? And God says, yeah, we can talk about it. But I want you to know I'm right and he's wrong. Because, Stephen, the moment you begin to go after my people, the moment you begin to beat my people, the moment you begin to fleece my people, you're gone. I'm looking for someone who will feed my flock. That's all I want. And then notice he goes on to say he could not go in. Look at Deuteronomy. Look at his screen. This is a great verse. And Deuteronomy 3, 23, i got to show you kind of an insight motive. I besought the Lord at that time, saying, O oh Lord God, this is a great prayer, Thou has begun to show thy servant greatness. God, you are so cool. You are blessing me. You're beginning to show me greatness. And the mighty hand for what God is there in heaven. God, you are so cool or in earth that can do according to thy works and according to thy might. Stephen, that's great. Now, wait a second. If I came to you or you came to me and you said, Pastor Steve, your hair is beginning to grow. Oh, really? Yeah. And boy, you're really losing weight. Really? Yeah. And man, you're kind of handsome. Yeah, okay, okay. And I just want to tell you, I mean, man, it's just unbelievable, your wisdom. and all. Great. And then all of a sudden they say, uh, can I have a raise? <laughs> have you ever done that? Have you ever baited anybody? Have you ever kind of set somebody up? Have you ever said to your wife, hey, honey, man, everything's great. What do you want? Nothing? Now, honey, how many times have you come home and said everything's great? Maybe twice. Oh, what do you want? Well, I just want to know if I can go out fishing with the guys for three days. <laughs> no. Okay. Just I thought I'd ask. But look at verse 25. I pray thee, let me go over. Uh-oh, what? Now, what did God say? No. What did Moses say? You are great. You're awesome. You're together. I see great things. You're working in my heart. Uh, can, I, can I go over? I pray thee, let me go over and see the good land beyond Jordan and the goodly mountains and Lebanon, all the great things you've done, God. But the Lord, the conjunction, but the Lord was wroth with me for your sake and would not hear me. I don't even want to listen, Moses. The Lord said to me, let it suffice thee, speak no more on this issue. Moses, no. I appreciate that. Because if he would have given in, then I realize there is no standard. Sometimes we think, well, then I shouldn't be here. You're right. In other words, if you're not willing to live under that accountability, then you shouldn't do it. If you're going to go out of control on people, you shouldn't be here. And if you think that God's wrong and you're right, you shouldn't be here. So I really do believe in my heart that if the staff is misdirected, I've misdirected them. Or I haven't communicated, or I haven't sat down, or I haven't fired them, or I haven't warned them. I haven't done something myself. I just can't blame everybody else, and that's what people do. They blame everybody. And Moses is saying, no, I've had it with this generation. God says, well, I haven't. So you have to go. What do I do? That's the question. What do I do? And so secondly, what must I do? And I want to give you six things to think about. Six things I think will help you never make this mistake, the glory of God. I must ask this question in 1 Corinthians 6.12, will it enslave me? If I want to do something, is it going to enslave me? All things are expedient, all things are lawful to me, but all things are not. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. In other words, is it going to make me think different, do things different, sometimes caffeine, really wigs me out. Well, could you tell us when? Well, I don't really have that much. But if I go out with you and have a cappuccino, I could go crazy. Well, could you tell us what kind of cappuccino? I don't know. So best not to give me cappuccino because I just go crazy. It takes a whole day to calm me down. So is it good for me to have cappuccino before I come here Sunday morning? No. 
We like your brain just the way it is. Okay, then it's my responsibility not to put myself under that authority. Or do I go back to drugs and be under the bondage? No. So it's important that I have a responsibility before God. So if I desire to give glory to God, if I really want to honor God with my wife, my family, the ministry, out in the public, whatever I do with the community, and then number one, I have to have certain things that hold me in check. Not people, God, number one. Does it enslave me? If I'm going to do this, is it going to enslave me? Number two, I must ask this question. Will it hinder me? Is it going to hinder me? In other words, if I go to this pornography show, is that going to hinder me? You bet your life is going to hinder you. All of a sudden, you're walking out, and someone walks in from the church, and they say, what are you doing here? And I say, what are you doing here? You know, I just came to minister to you. You know, that's why I'm here. Well, I just lied. I'm here because of why. Well, that's the question. Something's wrong in my life. I'm going after the wrong type of lust, not the lust of God. I've allowed something to try to pervert my mind, thinking that's really love, and it's not. And so I realize I'm, being, I'm hindering God from using my life. Or all of a sudden, I have an attitude. It can hinder you. Or I'm beginning to do things I shouldn't. It hinders my walk. What you're doing now, is it hindering you? Well, some people might be working in a bar, and you think, well, you know, I just don't feel good about it. Then you have to leave. It's hindering what you're doing. Some people say, well, I don't have a conviction. Others do. You have to do what God tells you to do. If it's going to hinder your growth, if it's going to keep you back, if it's going to keep you away from being all that you can keep yourself from being, then turn off the NFL and get back to church. It's a small sacrifice to make. Number three, I must ask this question, will it edify me? In other words, is it going to build me up? And 1 Corinthians 10, 23, notice the very last saying, all things are lawful for me, but all things do not edify. If I'm at the Starbucks, you come over and I'm having a beer. Are you going to be edified? I don't think so. If I have a cigarette and a cigar in my mouth and I'm drinking a bud, are you going to be happy? No. Do I have the right to do that? Yeah. Is it going to stumble you? Yes, then I can't do it. Do I want to do it? No. Now, let me take it one step further. Can I do it at home? You can do whatever you want. But why are you hiding it from the kids? If you're going to do it at home, do it in front of them. They know it already. They have found the cabinet. They know where your stuff's at. So why are you hiding it? If you're going to watch an R-rated movie, why send them to bed? In other words... Don't live that double standard. Don't live one way you want your kids to act, and you're going to live a whole different way because you're going to send a message that Christianity is not working in this home at all. So it doesn't edify. And by the way, sometimes we say, hey, you know, we want you to get involved in leadership. Okay, great. I'll do it. Well, we don't kind of want you smoking or drinking. But why? Well, that's just our conviction. Well, you know, the Bible says that I can drink. Well, where do you get that? The Bible says Timothy said that you know, drink a little wine for your stomach's sake. Okay, here's the test. How many Timothys do we have here? All the Timothys, raise your hand, please. I want you to know that in all four services, there was not one Timothy. There any Timothy here? No Timothy? No drinking? Paul said, Timothy, you drink. And by the way, it was six to one. Six to one. You couldn't get drunk. So why do I have to do it? Well, Steve, I think you're legalistic. Don't think that. Just say this. I don't want to get involved in your leadership. Okay, that's great. You sit at home, go ahead and drink, go out, have a glass of wine, all that stuff. But here's what I don't want. You're in charge of the couples, and you're having a glass of wine, and another couple who's struggling sees you, and everything you believe, everything you taught them, they don't believe. Now, is that right? No, but that's how they think. You stumbled them. So because you're going to stumble them, do you have a greater love to not do it? And I have the answer. Yeah, I don't have to do it. And then we realize, number four, I must ask the question, will it bring glory to God? Will it bring glory to God? In other words, in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether, therefore, you eat or drink, whatever you do, do for the glory of God. My language towards my teenager, does it bring glory to God? <laughs> no. The way I treat my wife, does it bring glory to God? No. The way I... Talk behind my boss's back. Does that bring glory to God? No. Then why are you doing it? Oh, it makes me mad. I didn't ask you that. If it does not bring glory to God and you call yourself a Christian, it'd be best not to call yourself a Christian and do what you want. 
But if you're going to call yourself a Christian, then do what God says. Don't let there be a double standard in your life. Be above all that. Have that excellent spirit like David, like a Daniel, like a Joshua, you know, like a Caleb, able to climb a mountain at 80 years old because he had a willing and an excellent spirit in his heart. In other words, nothing could dominate him. Everything he did, if you can't pick up a cigarette butt in a parking lot, with the, without the joy, then don't touch it because I don't want you picking up that cigarette, but I can't believe these filthy smokers. And then you see someone smoking and you want to run over them. Don't do that. But if you can pick that thing up for the glory of God and throw it in the trash, pick it up. But don't do it if you can't do it for the glory of God because you're going to get bitter. And then number five, ask the question, will it build my life? Will it build me up? Notice in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 8, for though I should boast somewhat more of our authority, which the Lord has given us for edification and not for your destruction. In other words, am I going to destroy you in what I say? Well, I don't want to do that. Is there a better way for me to say it? Can I think about it? Can I wait? Just because God showed me, do I have to do it right now? Can I sit down with my son? Can I show my son how to do it? There's just better ways. But we are so impatient and so uptight, we hurt people. And they don't forget that. And that's what Moses did. And lastly, I must ask myself the question, will this strengthen my life? Will it make me better for the kingdom of God? And 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eye and the pride of the life is not of the Father, but of the world. Here is the killer. Will it bring God honor? And the answer is no. Then I don't want to do it. So when Moses heard what he had to do, somewhere he got rid of God's stick and took his stick because he was going to do some damage. And somewhere between what he heard God tell him to say and what he said, it turned. And instead of the people enjoying the water, they became afraid of God. And Mo God said, come here, today, 120 years, you've never done this, but today, you hurt my people. And you scared them. And you frightened them. But more than that, you told them, I don't like them. And I'm mad at them. And I'm not. I'm upset with you. Because you didn't listen. And then we're closed with this thought. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, Wherefore, let him that think he stand take heed lest he fall. Be careful. And the reason why, there has no temptation taken you, but such as common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are by able. But with all temptation arise, make a way of escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Moses, back away. I can't believe this young generation. Moses, back away. Get your thought. I put you in the wilderness for, for 40 years. You can bear this. It just got to him. And in that moment, that little moment, he exploded, but he hurt God. He hurt the people, and he destroyed his ministry. So be careful. And when people tell you that God does not love you, that's not right. God loves you, and God died for you, and God wants you to know that he's not upset. He's willing to work with you. But when pastors begin to say, if you don't give, we're going to die, then let them die. Let them go. When God guides, he what? Provides. God's not in trouble. 